We've been talking about discipleship. <clears throat> and we spent the last couple weeks talking about the call that Jesus called his disciples to him. He is still calling disciples to him. We looked at the aspects of that call. We understand that there was a demand that when you come to Christ, you come via the cross. You come giving everything. There's no negotiation. It's an all or nothing proposition. Okay? We understand the grace that He has extended to us. We understand the promise that He would never leave us, never forsake us. But today I want to get into the actual physical, the, the manifestation, the playing out of discipleship. But before we do that, I'm going to back up for a minute, okay? Because I want to explain to you what my job is in this, okay? So we're in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Paul is writing. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. I'm going to leave it to you to back up and read what comes before so you can understand this in context, okay? But in verse 11, he says, And he... The he that he is referring to is Jesus. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Uh, some translations have pastors and teachers. Now there's uh, an ongoing disputation as to how many offices are actually represented here. Some people say that there are five offices, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Other people say it's four. There's apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher. I personally subscribe to the theory that there are five because I have known men who excel at being a pastor, but they couldn't teach to save their lives. And I know men who excel at teaching as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm friends with uh, probably one of the most fantastic teachers that I've ever met. But he, he, he's not a pastor. He doesn't have a pastor's heart. When people come to him with problems, he gets flustered. And he, he, he has a hard time relating. That's why I believe this is a five-fold ministry gift, okay? So I believe this, this description, the five-fold gifts, are what are developed with what are elders. These are what we would look in the church um, governing the ecclesiarch. And these would be the elders. These, these positions would be fulfilled by elders. Okay? And, and yet, I'm, I don't want to talk to you about these positions. I want to talk to you about what comes next. Because what comes next is an understanding of what these positions do. Okay? So, Starting in 11 again, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the broad body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, I'm going to break this down just so you kind of understand what's happening here. Okay? Because in order to understand discipleship, you've got to understand what my place is as, as pastor of Jesus Community Church. And you need to understand what your place is as a member of the body. Okay? So, my job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So what is your job? The work of ministry. To be equipped so that you can minister. 
<gasps> because you realize I am not the only minister in this body, right? You, you realize you are each and every one of you called to be ministers. Every one of you. Now, not necessarily to the office of an elder in one of these fivefold ministry gifts, but every one of you is called to minister because you are called as a part of the body of Christ. Okay? We talked a couple weeks ago about the working of, of the body of Christ and how in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that, that no part can say to the other parts, I don't need you. Nor can the part say, I am not needed. All parts work together so that the body will function the way it is supposed to. Okay? I think one of the best signs of a healthy church is a body functioning across the broad spectrum of ministry. Okay? That, that means that you go into a church, you don't want everybody to be a teacher. Okay? Because then, where would be those who do helps? Where would be those with the gifts of administration, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving? We want to see the spectrum of Christian ministry being worked out because we're all called to different places. Okay? So, my job is to equip you and to build you up, second half of verse 12, for building up the body of Christ. What is our end goal? Let's look at 13. Our end goal is that we would all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. That, that word manhood, women, you're not off the hook. It's the equivalent of adulthood, to be a grown-up. Okay? So it's not saying, oh, oh, men, you're in, women, you're out. That's not what's going on here. Okay? It's saying you're growing up. Okay? So, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. So my job, according to this, is to build you guys into that place where you might reach the fullness of Christ. Okay? And that's going to look different in each one of you. Because each one of us is unique. Isn't that incredible? How God, you know, I, I, I marvel. You know, they say that, uh, statistically speaking, that no two snowflakes will ever be the same. Okay? That, that, that astounds me. And yet when I look around this room, really that doesn't. Because God has put such diversity in how He makes us. We have five children. We have four children by law that, that have married into our family. We have eight grandchildren. It never ceases to amaze me how unique each and every one of them is. When Christopher was born, we had a unique child. Those of you that know Christopher know he's unique. <laughs> and then Donovan came. And Donovan was a unique child. But he was uniquely different than unique Christopher. And so we thought, okay, we got two ends here. We got the free spirit, and we got the nerd. <laughs> All right? Hey, man, I, I take pride in I am like the king of the nerds. I like order. Christy is the queen of the free spirits. And we precariously balance this relationship. And then Benjamin was born. And I realized that unique Christopher was not, in fact, a free spirit. He's kind of in the middle. Because God in His creative uniqueness created unique Benjamin to be a free spirit. And I, I am so appreciative that God gave me two children beforehand to prepare me. I remember, gosh, I don't think he was about a year old. And Christy was carrying him down the stairs, carrying Benjamin down the stairs in our townhouse. Benjamin always loved to make people laugh. And I don't really know, I'll let you explain a little better him making you laugh coming down the stairs. He was, he was actually six months old. Six months. I started coming down the stairs and he turned around and looked at me. And the way he turned his head made me laugh. 
And so then he thought for a second, he turned around and did it again, it made me laugh. And he did it all the way down the stairs. As long as I kept laughing, he kept turning and making the face at me. Six months old, and he wanted to make people laugh. So now we have this broad spectrum. I like to tell the story when Christopher and Benjamin, or Donovan, would get ready for bed. We'd send them in the room to change for pajamas. And Christopher would go in, and he'd take off a shoe. And he'd take off a sock. And he'd take off another shoe. And you'd walk in the room, and you'd think your child had exploded. And then Donovan. He would take off his shoe. Please. And he would take off his sock and he'd roll it into a little ball. Tuck it in the shoe. And, and you walked in and you thought Mary Poppins had paid a visit. <laughs> that was the unique difference between the two. And then, then we have Benjamin. It took me a long time and I, I still don't fully understand. Christy has to interpret for me. <laughs> Uh, we were living in a house, and it was over in, in Hamilton, and it was hot out, and the kids were out playing in the sprinkler, and Benjamin wanted to go play in the sprinkler. So he told them, okay, go get your swimsuit on, and you can go play in the sprinkler, and off he trotted. About ten minutes later, oh, I guess he was, what, six, maybe? Four. Four. Four years old. I, I go back to the bedroom to pick something up, and I hear something in his, his room, thinking, I thought they were all out playing in the sprinkler. And so I kind of leaned in the room, leaned out of the room. I gotta have Christy explain this. <laughs> so I went and I got Christy and I said, I, I know Benjamin tends to be more like you. Can you please explain to me what's happening here? So I took her back to the bedroom and there, butt naked, with my four-year-old son squatted playing with toys monsters and robots totally oblivious to the world and she laughed she knew immediately what happened oh he went in to change his clothes and saw the toys and I'm thinking he did not notice the draft <laughs> and he in his uniqueness was perfectly content to play toys but naked <laughs> so then in the midst of this some years go by, and, and I'm, I'm gradually adjusting to this new paradigm. And then God gives us a girl. A girl. I have four siblings. There are four boys in my family and one girl. And that one girl made up for all of us boys. My sister was very... fragile with her moods. <laughs> she was delicate. And she could go from laughing to crying to mad in shorter than it took me to tell you that. And so I was always nervous about having a girl. And, and God gave us a girl. And Christian and I were determined. We are going to let her figure out what kind of girl she wants to be. And she was very young, and, and we'd not bought her a baby because we didn't want her. If she wanted to be pink, she could be pink. That was her choice. But I wasn't going to make her pink. And she comes walking out of the boys' bedroom with a little action figure. Uh, they were the um, dolls there about this tall. It was, I think, a G.I. Joe or something. And she comes walking out with a washcloth wrapped around the action figure. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> All right, babe, we need to get her a doll. And so we got her a doll. And my daughter talks a lot. And we had a rule. I, I would tell her, Mackenzie, you're motoring. You're making me tired. Can you just stop for a little while? And one day she was talking, we were driving home, and it was her and Christy and I, and she's talking, and, and she's talking about shoes. I don't get shoes. I mean, the 
people that are all up about shoes, I don't get them. Okay? I put them on my feet to protect my feet, and I hide them so you won't see my feet. Okay? So I wear shoes for a practical purpose. And she's talking about all these different shoes. And I said, all right, that's it. When we get home, you're getting boxing gloves. I am buying you boxing gloves. No more shoes. Boxing gloves. And she was quiet for about two blocks. Aha! There's a secret boxing glove. Quiet. I get it. And then she goes, could I have pink of them? <laughs> pink boxing gloves. Okay, so now we have this new paradigm. And, and my daughter falls more on the nerd side. So right now the paradigm has shifted in my favor. We've got more nerds than we've got free spirits. But i got to tell you, on that scale between nerds and free spirits, free spirits way more. <laughs> they do. Because one free spirit can upset the balance of a dozen nerds. <laughs> okay? And so into this mix, God places Thaddeus. Okay? And here comes Satch who, before he came to Christ, was one of the most nervous children I have ever seen anywhere. I, 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 I can look to God's hand in his life by how much peace he has now versus what he had before. When he was born, they took him off to the room to go check his blood and do all the stuff that they do and put the cute little footsies on the ink and stamp the, and do all that stuff. And we hear him crying. And, and it's loud. And the nurse comes back in and we said, what is going on? So what do you mean? I said, that is our child crying. We know it's our child because there's only two people in here and the lady in the next room has not yet delivered. We know because she's screaming. <laughs> and our child is louder than her. She said, you shouldn't be able to hear him. He's all the way on the other side of the, the ward. So we can hear him. He was loud. My point in all of this is this. Each one of our children is unique. Each one of you is unique. God has carefully and masterfully worked you so that you can fill a unique position in the body. Each one of you has been called by Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of all. Each one of you has a unique position in the body of Christ that you are called to fulfill. Now part of my job is to equip you such that you can effectively perform and fill that job, that ministry, that place. My job <clears throat> is to help you Matures. To help you grow beyond that initial infancy when you come into Christ and you are a new creation. When each one of my children were born, I was there. And each one of them was uniquely new. Not a one of them came out ready to work. Not one. They didn't even know how to eat. Some of them had to figure out how to breathe. They were new. And yet when believers come into the body of Christ, there's almost this assumption that they're going to be instantly mature. And that, that, that okay, they prayed the prayer and we turn them loose. Remember what Jesus said in the, the Great Commission? What was our call? Was our call to make converts? No. No. It was a call to make disciples. So each one of us, and although my job here is specifically said to equip you, your job is to be there and to function as the body of Christ to help nurture and care for those new babes. Some of you in one way, some of you in another. We're going to flip over real quick. I'm going I'm to wrap this up. 
a little bit short today. Turn with me to uh, the book of Hebrews, if you would please. <clears throat> I'm going to read a passage out of the book of Hebrews. Discipleship. My job is to promote, to push discipleship such that you would grow. Your job is to be discipled and at some point also to disciple. Now we're going to read a passage. And this, this passage is actually kind of a downer in the book of Hebrews. The author is writing to the Jewish Christians. Okay? And, and we look at that and say, well, then it doesn't apply to me because I'm not Jewish. It does apply to you because God saw fit to include it in the totality of His Word. He knew you were going to need it. He knew I was going to need it. Okay? So we're going to pick up in chapter 5. I'm going to start right towards the end. And I'm going to read through part of chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Um, before I start, the author is writing, he's talking about Jesus being the high priest, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, not of the Aaronic lineage. Okay, and that's significant, but we'll talk about that at another time. Okay, so in verse 11, he says, About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Note that. Note that. One of the most dangerous things for a Christian is to become dull of hearing. You don't receive the Word of God in your life. Okay? Throughout the book of Hebrews, the author says, um, Today, if you receive His Word, if you hear His Word, do not harden your heart. He cautions us, do not harden our heart. Okay. So he calls them dull of hearing, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need someone to get you back to the basics, the foundational principles. You should be teachers, but you need a teacher. He goes on, he says, you need milk, not solid food. Your babes. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. Now I want you to pay attention here. Because he lists out three pairs of doctrines. Three. You notice like three pairs of doctrines. Okay? So the foundational principles. He says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. And he pairs it with and of faith towards God. The root of our faith, right here. This is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Repentance and faith. Okay? These are the things that God has placed in us. The call to repent, to turn away from. And to believe in what you cannot see. Faith. Then he moves on. And of instructions about washings. Now some of you in, in your translation might say baptisms. Okay? The ESB and I believe the NASB use the word washings because the, the word uh, baptismo, which we get baptized from, is not being used here. It's actually a plural word, baptizu, and it means more, more than one. He's actually talking about 
the, the teaching of, of the washings where the Jews, uh, if you remember, when Jesus was in His earthly ministry, He was invited to a Pharisee's house to eat. And He and His disciples came in and, and they started eating. And, and the Pharisee said, why, why do you not honor the traditions of our elders? You don't wash before you eat. And Jesus responded, you know, it, it's not the outside that makes the inside dirty. It's the inside that makes the outside dirty. And, and he, he kind of corrupted him, or corrected him in, and you remember that's when he called them uh, uh, whitewashed sepulchers. Okay? So what what's, they're saying here is these ritualistic washings that they would do. Now some they were called of God, but, but in the traditions of the Jews, they added more and more on to what God had called them to do. So this is why in, in my translation it reads washings. Because he's not, not referring to the baptism that you have after repentance uh, of John's baptism or of Christ's baptism. But if you notice, he pairs the, the baptisms, the washings, look what he pairs it with. And of the laying on of hands. Now what's interesting about this, uh, you'll see in the New Testament a couple references to the laying on of hands. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see the laying on of hands when someone was anointed or called to a particular position, to a place. They, the elders would lay hands on them. In the New Testament, Paul cautions Timothy. He says, uh, do not be eager, do not be anxious in the laying on of hands. Don't put, don't put somebody into a place they're not ready for. Okay, But the laying on of hands in the early church also represented, after baptism, the, the physical representation of their repentance... Then, throughout the book of Acts, we see there was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they would receive power from on high. And this was often done, if you read through the book of Acts, it was often done by the laying on of hands. See, I don't, I don't think the, the actual reference here is to the laying on of hands for an anointed elder or leader in the body of Christ. I think what he's talking about is the baptism of water and the baptism of fire. Okay? The washings and the infilling. All right. So then he goes on. He says uh, the, the third pairing. He says uh, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Okay. Now what's interesting about this is the author is writing to the Hebrews, and yet we know that there was a party, uh, a sect within the Hebrews that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. As a matter of fact. Jesus confronted them on this issue. They tried to trap him. Remember the Sadducees. They came and they said, Master, you're, you're, you're wise in all things. Answer us this question. A man marries a woman. And he has six brothers. And before she has conceived a child, he dies. And according to the law, she is handed to the next brother. Thank God we are set free from that law. <laughs> okay? And, and yet, the second brother dies as well, and so on down the line to the seventh brother. And then he dies. So, at the resurrection, now see, you, you know they're saying this very snidely. They think they're getting one over on Jesus. Because their, their attitude is, at the resurrection, they don't believe there's going to be a resurrection. They think they've trapped it through their logic. And, and whose wife will she be? And he doesn't even address their, their question so much as he addresses their heart. It says, you're mistaken. You're wrong. You don't understand the Scriptures. He challenges them on their learning, their understanding. He says, in heaven there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. That we will be like the angels in heaven. Okay, And the whole point is that there was a sect that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so this author, knowing this, he, he's speaking about the foundational principle of our Christian faith. There is going to be a resurrection of the dead because Jesus is the first fruits of that. And if He rose from the dead, then we will rise from the dead. Okay? So he's writing not just to Jews, but he's writing to Jewish believers. So if there were Sadducees that came into the faith, this was a critical point for them. This is something that went completely contrary to what they believed. But it's foundational to a believer in Jesus Christ. Paul addresses it repeatedly. And he says the resurrection of the dead, and he pairs it with eternal judgment. 
So at the very beginning, we have the basic foundation of our, our faith, repentance. And at the end, we have the ultimate end of our faith, eternal judgment. As a believer, unto eternal life. As an unbeliever, unto eternal death. So what we are going to do over the course of the next few weeks is we are going to break apart each one of these foundational doctrines of the Christian faith and I want you to be so knitted in with an understanding of why these are important that you can give an answer whenever anyone gives you a question. So, you believe that you're actually going to be resurrected, what, like as an elephant? No, 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 that, that's reincarnation. No, it says it's given to man once to die and then to judgment. Okay, we're not talking about that. You guys need to be grounded. So, some of you are going to look at this and go, yeah, I, you're not telling me anything new. Good, good, perfect. But we're going to start off with the basics. And then we're going to move on into some other things. Amen? Amen. 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 So, you already know where we're going. Homework this week. Start looking at these foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. We'll get into those next week. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that your word is life and truth. We thank you that you have sent us your spirit to teach us all things, to remind us of all things. Help us, Father, to be steadfast. Help us, Father, to be passionate about your word. Father, that our hearts would be turned toward you, our thoughts would be stayed on you. Father, that we would be a people that gives you pleasure. Grow us in you, Father. Mature us. Give us the boldness that we need to accomplish all that you have asked of us. Give us wisdom and discernment that we would know when and how to act, when and what to say. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>